The AI revolution in academia and in research has long arrived and it's here to stay with whether we like it or not, whether you agree or disagree with the use of AI for research purposes, for writing papers in the academia in general, AI is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It's like with the computers, you know, when they first arrived, there was probably a lot of debate whether they should be used, whether that technology is even allowed, or should we continue, you know, doing research on typewriters and reading books in the library rather than do it all on our computers. But, you know, the computers are still here and they're not going anywhere. And the same thing is with AI. Many universities are banning the use of AI completely for writing theses. You know, some journals are prohibiting the use of AI as well in papers, but really AI is going to stay here. And I think as PhD students or researchers, we need to learn how to use it appropriately. And I think as academia, as a whole, we also need to learn how to adjust to this new, you know, AI tools that are out there to this AI revolution and to utilize it properly to our advantage. Because I think as any technology, you know, it can, it's a double-edged sword, right? It can be used to our advantage to really save ourselves a lot of time on menial tasks and time that could then be spent on doing some really important creative research work, right? But at the same time, you know, AI can really be misused. And in this video, I want to talk about an article that was published on Nature's uh, blog. And the article is entitled, How ChatGPT and Other AI Tools Could Disrupt Scientific Publishing. The world of AI assisted writing and reviewing might transform the nature of the scientific paper. And really, you know, it, it starts off with, with the story of the radiologist Domenico Mastrodisca, and who, you know, whenever he's stuck, he uses ChatGPT to help him get unstuck. And I don't think Domenico is on his own there. Maybe a lot of researchers or PhD students are afraid to admit that they use ChatGPT because, you know, their universities might completely disapprove or maybe even ban the use of tools like ChatGPT. But I think many of us really, if we're honest with each other, maybe leave a comment below. We do use ChatGPT, if not on a daily, then on a weekly basis to really to get unstuck. And what I found ChatGPT is really good at and what that's what Domenico uh, says here. It can be a sounding board, right? So really, you know, what you can do is, for example, uh, give ChatGPT uh, your aim of, the, of your for your research and ask it to, for example, prepare an outline for the introduction, an outline for the literature review, or you can give it, you know, the, the research gap and ask it to come up with, you know, a good research question. So you can you can use it as a as a chatting partner as well and ask ChatGPT questions and this can really help you to brainstorm ideas and get unstuck because writing research papers can be a very lonely process. So I think there's you know there's really time and place to use um, ChatGPT and as uh, Dominique says here in this article you know it allows him. And I think a lot of us to produce publication ready manuscripts much faster because, you know, we can also use ChatGPT to help us to, for example, proofread the text as well. And, and as a sounding board, really, to see, you know, if a paragraph is structured coherently and to brainstorm ideas for further problems. As the article says here, you know, ChatGPT can be very useful for making suggestions on how to convey something in a clearer way, in a more concise way. For example, you can give it a paragraph and ask it to condense it to make it more precise right to, to make it clearer and it's it's interesting to note you know that N nature did a survey as well and, and it seems that you know scientists who use tools like ChatGPT, those large and um, la uh, language models are still in the minority but i think that number is going to continue rising you know and here you know they talk about the fact that non-native english speakers could benefit most from uh, from these tools in terms of you know, editing quickly, summarizing papers. I mean, in, in my experience, I, I wouldn't really divide it into you know, native, non-native speakers who can benefit more. At Academic English Now, to be honest with you, we have quite a lot of native speakers who come to us for help um, with writing a PhD thesis, for help with um, writing research papers. And to be honest, a lot of them struggle with the very same issues that non-native speakers struggle with. Because whether you speak English as a first or as a second language, I mean, scientific writing is, is really a different language altogether, anyway, that you have to learn. So I think 
you know, ChatGPT it can be useful for any researcher and any PhD student, regardless of the first language. Um, and, you know, one way, one interesting way in which scientists are using ChatGPT, according to this article, and that's something that I've seen as well, is to really kind of, um, you know, interrogate the results and and summarize them better and to chat to chat with ChatGPT quite literally about the results. Now, when I was reading this article as well, one, one thing that stuck with me and that I kind of strongly disagree with is what Michael Eisen, an ESS, who's a computational biologist at the University of California in Berkeley, I quote, he says, it's never really the goal of anybody to write papers, it's to do science. And I think that's the reason why so many PhD students and researchers are not good writers, because you think of yourself as only as researchers, but really if you think about it, of course, producing data and producing good research is your job, but equally, like, you're a professional writer, because you know, your results, the data that you produce will only be valuable and will only give you points in the university, will only be read by other people if you write about it. And the reason why certain scientists, I think, you know, are so well, well known and worldly renowned is because they're able to convey complex ideas in simple terms. In other words, they're professional writers. They really know how to write very well be it for the purposes of a journal publication or be it for the purposes of general public and writing a you know a more popular science blog or book. So I, I, I really disagree with what Michael here says and I think if more of us saw ourselves as professional writers rather than just researchers, producing research papers and an excellent PhD thesis it would be so much easier. Now one problem with those um, large um, language models such as ChatGPT is that you know they produce a lot of inaccuracies and falsehoods. So basically, you know, what they produce sometimes, you ask ChatGPT to give you references or to suggest similar articles, and it's just going to invent stuff, right? You might ask ChatGPT also to explain certain concepts to you, and you never know whether what ChatGPT says is actually accurate, because it tends to just invent stuff. That's a real, real problem here. Yeah, and I think, you know, as the article mentions here, technology like that is concerning for a lot of people. And I think publishers are, are right to be concerned about certain things, such as, um, for example, you know, people just using ChatGPT to write an entire paper, right? Or ChatGPT just producing fake data, right? And, and fake, completely fake papers and completely fake sites. And, you know, if the peer review process is not able to identify that, then we're going to end up in a really, really big mess. And the interesting thing is, you know, whether whether actually plagiarism software is and will be able to detect content generated by ChatGPT and other large language learning models. So I think, you know, it's still a, a gray area and things are moving very fast. And I think those plagiarism detection softwares are getting better and better. But according to this article, that is published in Nature, there, there is still no reliable tool that publishers can use to, you know, 100% detect a text that has been written by AI. So, you know, as I mentioned, what, what publishers or universities do, then if they, you know, if they don't have a tool that allows them to always detect um, texts that have been written by those uh, large, large language learning models like ChatGPT, they just ban it altogether. One of the huge publishers that has done so far uh, that has done this so far is Science. You know, it's one of the biggest publishers out there, and they have banned the use of ChatGPT and other AI tools like that. And other publishers, I I personally agree more with the second approach, which is just insisting on transparency, which is, for example, the policy at Nature, which is in probably one of the best journals um, out there. And um, and I think. Like with any other technology, banning it won't really change anything because if people still want to use it, they'll find a way around it and they'll find a way around that ban to still use AI. It's much more realistic to just tell researchers to be transparent. If they have used ChatGPT for a certain part of their paper, they should state so, so that both the reviewers and, and the editor and the publishers can see whether that use of the technology is appropriate and it's valid and if not they can reject that paper but i think 
banning any technology isn't going to change anything because people will find a way around it. And interestingly, you know, 70% of journals, that's almost three quarters of all journals, have some sort of guidelines um, in terms of how AI tools can be used um, in their journal. And, you know, there are there is also talk um, of developing sort of a uniform set of guidelines, you know, that to help researchers to be transparent about the use of AI. And I think this would be really, really helpful for the entire scientific community because it's it's like with, for example, referencing guidelines. You know, if we knew kind of overall what is allowed and what isn't allowed and what we have to be transparent about and report in terms of using ChatGPT and other tools like that, I think this would be incredibly helpful for the all scientists. And of course, you know, as mentioned previously, editors and publishers and you know, PhD supervisors, universities are concerned because these AI tools can lead to producing a lot of fake articles with fake data, even with fake authors, you know, because they can just generate any sort of content they, they wish to generate. So the journals and publishers and universities definitely need better tools to be able to detect that fraud. Because let's be honest, if, if you've used ChatGPT to generate an entire paper, or if you fake the data, just because you want to publish something, that's true. And that's just not a lot. And, you know, we need tools to be able to detect it. But at the same time, as I said, I think these AI tools can be incredibly useful. And I think they should be used. And I think we should be transparent about how we use them. And there should be guidelines as well from publishers and universities on how to use them ethically. Banning them will not change anything. It's as if somebody had tried banning the computer 50 years ago, you know, the computer is here and by banning AI, we're only going to miss out on a lot of benefits that it has and people will still continue. So what I think we need is better guidelines on how to use AI. Now, if you want personalized help without AI to be able to write papers for Scopus Index journals, then group free one one consultation with my team. We're going to go over the biggest challenges that you have right now, the goals that you have, then we'll outline a simple plan for you and see how and if we can help you to write papers for scopes in this journey. So we've got three months one consultation, the link is right there.